Hello. Hello. Thanks for showing up. Um, my name is Frank Sibaldi. I run a nonprofit charity called Video Game History Foundation, and uh, it is uh, my. I'm, I'm very honored to be here with my friend Howard Phillips, the former game master of Nintendo. It's here for Howard. I'm happy to be here with Frank because I'm a big fan of what he and his foundation are doing. You'll hear more about that, but I'm blushing. <laughs> I feel like I should have cosplayed as Nestor for this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, he had this spiky hair. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, uh, we're going to do kind of two things here, I think. Um, I'd like to sort of run Howard through uh, his career, particularly his early career in Nintendo, because um, I think there's a lot of really fascinating insight that we've talked about privately, you know, that, that I think a lot of people just don't know about. If it gets boring, just start rolling your eyes, and we'll take that as the cue to kind of go faster. Um, and then uh, we also uh, want to talk to you a little bit more about the work that we're doing together to preserve video game history, um, which, uh, I don't know, you guys into that? Yeah. Yeah. questions that you have, I want to make sure that we leave a lot of time for just open-ended questions. Um, because I was in a really unique position being a game player and being on like the front line of 500 plus games to come through Nintendo. And, and after all the arcade games, of course, came through Nintendo. And I want to be able to share what that was like with all of you because it was really fun. Just a quick show of hands, how many people think you might uh, be asking a question just so I can time it? Okay, that's a pretty healthy number, cool. I hope to see more of you ask a question. Um, well, so Howard, you started your video game career in uh, 1981 at Nintendo, is that right? Yep, October 81. October 81, and uh, um, this is Nintendo in 1981, right? This is the uh, Christmas party. Yeah, and the geeky looking guy on the far <laughs> left there um, wearing a suit because we were dressed up for a Christmas party. And that's all of Nintendo in 1981. Um, this is like two months after I'd started. Um, there's uh, Mr. Kamada, um, uh, Mr. Arakawa's wife, John Pedersen, Mr. Arakawa, the Butter Monkey. Below them is Shigeru Ota, who did like bookkeeping and stuff, um, and Jimmy Henderson, who did parts. Mm, I can't remember that engineer's name. He was only there for a brief stint. Above him, Al Stone, Ron, Judy, Rob Thompson, me the geek, and then Don James, my uh, friend who hired me behind me. So uh, you just mentioned a butter monkey, but <laughs> can we, let's zoom in on that. <laughs> so, so explain the butter monkey, Howard. Um, I don't know whose idea it was, but uh, this was at a bar that was just down the street from the warehouse in Tuckwilla, Washington, which is a suburb and about in the middle of nowhere back then. Um, and so I guess Simon's the restaurant where Ron and Al used to go drink every afternoon while the Donkey Kong sales numbers were coming in and they would just go celebrate every afternoon. <laughs> and they got, the, they got the butter monkey made. And the thing that was interesting about it was that we kept it for about a year oh, no. in, in the warehouse, <laughs> in the shipping office where I worked on top of a, of a metal cabinet, so it just sat up there. Didn't smell bad, um, <laughs> at least we couldn't get close enough to tell. But the funny thing about it was it had these, this big thumbprint on its rear end <laughs> that uh, Mrs. Arakawa had put there. <laughs> so Nintendo 1981, um, basically when you came in, they had just shipped Donkey Kong pretty recently at that point, like July, August, something like that, right? Yeah, they just started shipping in August. I joined in October. They probably done maybe a thousand at that point. Um, and then over the next year, we shipped, I shipped, myself and one other guy shipped um, over 60,000 of them, which because they're 40, 40 games in a 44 foot, or excuse me, 44 games in a 40 foot container, you know, the shipping containers, um, that made me, when I was 23 years old, the largest volume shipper on the entire West Coast. Well, um, because 
we were shipping so many containers of, of games through um, the Port of Seattle. And I think that record day was 191 40 foot containers. That's ridiculous. But keep in mind, for every one of those containers, you have to pull the games out, read the serial numbers off of each one, and then put them back in the truck that then would go to other places in the United States. So our record day was 191 containers. So you were, you were the uh, warehouse manager, essentially, when you started. Uh, shipping warehouse manager. Yeah. So this is the warehouse, right? That's the warehouse in Redmond, which we started in, I think, 83 or 84. Got it. Okay. So the Tuck Willow one was actually a little bit bigger than that because we started out with 60,000 square feet. It was just a big empty hall with a small office at one end of it where Arakawa and Ron Judy now Stone hung out. And then also there's a little service area um, in the back where John Pedersen um, would repair circuit boards that didn't work where the, the um, distributors would send them or operators would send them back to us for repair. That was 60,000 square feet and we would fill it up with arcade games and then ship them out every day, but we had to expand because we got so many arcade games that volume started getting so high that we doubled and we released another 60,000 square feet. So we had 120,000 square feet and we literally would fill it up with arcade games. And then that wasn't enough because we started doing um, final assembly work. So we would get all of the monitors and PC boards and uh, um, the control panels sent in from Nintendo in Japan and then we would manufacture cabinets locally and then do final assembly work. And then we needed even more room, so we ended up with, with 180,000 square feet, of which I was the shipping warehouse manager. And then we built this building um, out in Redmond, in the mud. So here's a, here's a rare shot of, uh, of the, the, oh, I forgot to pause the slide too. Of, uh, looks like Mario Brothers cabinets, is that? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's Mario Brothers that we were doing um, final assembly on. And then these are the, one, the ones, you're looking at the tops of the ones that are getting ready to be shipped out. And then uh, more cabinets or parts or something. Those, yeah, those are all parts. These are the arcade table. Um, funny, do you guys know what a tabletop looks like? A tabletop version? Sorry about, I'm going to point this thing in my mouth so you can hear me. <laughs> so you guys know what a tabletop looks like. So each of these had a tabletop. The typical arcade game, Nintendo arcade game, um, upright, was 250 pounds, very easy to hand truck. You just slam a hand truck on it, yank it off, and you can dance it. You just dance with it. Anyway, um, these ones, they're 150 pounds each. They're each in a crate, and there's three of them high. So it's 450 pounds each. There was only one guy who was a trucker I knew who, who worked for Far East Video to hand truck him, but none of us were brave enough to, to try and do that because they're really top heavy. Um, but what we used to do is, is we had a, um, you could pallet jack them around, but if you wanted to break them down so that somebody got not a multiple of three in their shipment, you had to cut the bands and then take them down. And we had a, um, a forklift you could do that with, but if you're really good, you found out that you could grab it up high, put your arms against it, and then, you know, all chiropractors, uh, chiropractors love this one. You could just like lean back with your back. <laughs> you could turn around and you could put it down without smashing it. So we did, used to do that regularly. Um, but the funniest thing about these is when we had a bunch of radar scopes and we needed to convert them. And so to convert them, we had to get them all out of their boxes. We had to take out the, um, take out the circuit board, PC boards. We had to change the, um, the decals, the instructions on them, etc. And if you look at these, they have, they have a wood skeleton. So we take, we take them and line them all up and you'd have like uh, 200 of them lined up on the floor. You use a, a pry bar to take out all of the top boards and then you use a hammer to knock out all the nails so that you could reuse the nails. I don't know why we did, but we did. <laughs> and we did this for like a month and we'd been, 
we're getting pretty good at unpackaging, unpackaging these things, saving all the nails, doing the conversions, putting them back in the box, and then using the same wood to, to finish them. You can't really see on this picture, but at the very bottom of the crate, do you see those little white, yeah, right at the bottom row. See those little white plasticky things? Talking about like these things? Yep. Yeah. It turns out that we, like literally one day we're just looking at those and going, what are those all about? I looked down and they were this little plastic thing was kind of pushed in. And I pulled on it and it popped out. And so I went and I pulled on the other three around the bottom of the crate and it popped out. And you could, when you did that, I don't know, some magic of, of crate making, whatever, you could just lift them straight up and off. <laughs> and we had literally done like 250 of these things where we you know, saved all the nails and everything and reassembled them. So that was Don James' uh, his first leadership um, error for me. We're saying, you know, we have to take all these things, save the nails, etc. Don James is still at Nintendo, by the way. Yeah, he is. Hopefully not doing stuff like that anymore. Um, <laughs> So not only were you the warehouse manager, you were maybe the first hire there who was like a gamer, right? Uh, yeah, uh, Ron and Al didn't play games, they just sold them. Mark, Al didn't play games. Don, Don and I played, we were friends, friends in, in uh, college and played together. Uh, we'd go out to arcades and things like that. Um, but he was more interested in industrial design and things like that. He didn't play in the warehouse hardly at all, but I was just always playing. Whenever we got in a, you know, these were the um, Mario Brother games, but whenever we got in a new game or whenever I'd go out on the on the test route, you know, I'd play the new games that were there just regularly. Yeah, so you were basically the one who was opening the mail from Japan with the brand new games in them, right? Yeah, which was very cool. Just imagine you get a bill of lading that says a whole bunch of Japanese characters didn't read Japanese, um, but then um, it said, um, video game on the top of it. So you, you knew it was a video game, but you didn't know what it was. And I'd get a big big crate, and I'd open it up, and it would be some crazy new game product or some Game & Watch or something. So I got Skyskipper that way, got um, Popeye that way, got all the Game & Watches that way, got the Famicom that way. Didn't know it was coming, it just showed up. <laughs> just go and you know, plug it into the wall and see what it does. So these are some pictures that you took around maybe 83, 84 of some of your coworkers, right? Yeah, so that's Arakawa, Ron, Judy, Al Stone, and, and Howard Lincoln. And they were really the core of the company. A lot of people think of Nintendo as this huge company. Um, we had, I think by the end of 84, I think we had 30 people working in the company. And it was by the end of 86, I think we had 60 people. Working. So this is after we've done the launch and, and everything. So it was a really small company, a small group of people with, I, I would say everybody doing everything, but the truth is that Ron and Al never moved it, you know, never used a hand truck. Uh, <laughs> neither, did, neither did Howard Lincoln. Mr. Arakawa did it a couple times, but we took the hand truck away from him because he was too tippy. <laughs> <laughs> and who were these two? Um, this is this is a little bit later when um, Nintendo got um, corporate. I guess the other guys kind of looked corporate, but but um, this is uh, Bruce Lowry and Frank Belus. Bruce Lowry was their consumer products guy before NES, so he was doing consumer products, selling the Game and Watches, and Frank Belus, who's um, not sure where he, which. Um, other arcade game company came from, but he ran arcades. Ron and Al were not really arcade sales. I mean, they were arcade salespeople for Donkey Kong, but they weren't really in the business. They were just two partners who had a trucking company, and a small trucking company locally, and didn't know what they were doing. They just kind of fell into it. And Frank had a background in working in the arcade industry as a, as a sales, so he came in as the, the head sales guy. Uh, this office does not look very exciting. Uh, no game. You notice no games. So these guys, this is when I say corporate, um, all of the games were in the warehouse, and that's where all the fun was, really. Uh, and now, if you think about game companies and people producing games, 
raincoat and stuff. There's games everywhere, right? But back then it was it was an anomaly. It was like you were selling toys or something, and so you didn't see toys around the office. People weren't playing with them. They were doing office work. But out in the warehouse, we were playing with the toys. <laughs> so you open the mail one day and you see this thing. Uh, yeah, so the Famicom brought, how many people are familiar with what the Famicom is? Okay, good. So it's the, the original 1983 version of the 8-bit of the um, Nintendo system, the NES. Um, it was so, <coughs> so awesome to plug this thing in and see that it played the exact same game on your home system, on the home television, as you were, as we played in the arcades with Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr. and and uh, some of some of the other games. It was so amazing back then for a television set to be able to play the same game that you had in the arcade because we we were used to the Atari 2600s with the shitty little character graphics on them, etc. And this thing looked exactly like the arcade games, the Nintendo games. I mean, Sega had some better graphic games with um, that came along with Outrun and things like that, but but this was just amazing. And then another really cool thing about this is that it used, this is the first home system um, to use the D-pad. And I don't know what, who, whose favorite controller is the original NES controller? Okay, I love you guys because you are true gamers. <laughs> Those things with the you know with the extra thumbsticks, very cool, etc. But it's kind of it's kind of like an automatic versus a stick car. <laughs> you know, you take away, you you start using those thumbsticks. Um, totally different experience from getting thumb burn from playing with the with this controller for hours and hours and hours. Um, it it was introduced with the Donkey Kong. Um, LCD game, the Game & Watch, the D-pad controller, invented by uh, Mr. Yokoi. Yokoi. Yokoi, yeah. Oh, yeah. was it Yokoi? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so that was developed, I think, in 83, right. it was really and sad. survived and survived as the dominant controller until you know, like for six or seven years. So it was an amazing invention. I read, I read something once about him where um, they had just kind of thrown a Donkey Kong D-pad into a controller just to try it when they were prototyping stuff. And they're like, oh wait, this is right. This is what, <laughs> yeah, it's, what, it's, what it should be. Incredibly precise, yeah. you know, very, very exacting in what it does. The angles, you know, a little bit harder to get those 45 degree angles. That's the, that's where the thumb burn comes from. but. Um, but a very precise controller. And if you look at the other controllers that came out around that time, or the ones that came before it with the, the silly little toothpicky joystick, when we were used to big, heavy, hard knob, whack them around arcade joysticks, and you couldn't do that with something that you were holding in your hand, you know, because it was just, it was not tethered to the ground or tethered to something like a 250 pound arcade game. So you needed, you know, that shift over the D-pad was, was a huge deal from us. And when Sega came out with their games and Coleco did, et cetera, and they had kind of a squishy, from my perspective, a squishy pad. And so I really, to me, this, this was the first example of just awesome Nintendo um, uh, hardware design, was that they had such a great controller. So you guys are excited about this uh, amazing home arcade system. Uh, the uh, U.S. retail industry not so excited about well, video games at this point. I was excited about it, um, but nobody else about the Famicom, which I just opened up, opened up the box, plugged this thing in, it was great, I could play it, it was awesome. But nobody else at Nintendo was really excited about it. Um, they were still thinking about the next arcade games. Don was thinking about, um, uh, about how to do the VS system and things like that and make cabinets for it. Um, but I was really enthusiastic because, again, I could play the same games maybe at my apartment then that I could play in the arcades or I could play in the warehouse, which was so cool. Uh, so I said, Mr. Arakawa, this is great. We've got to bring this out. This is awesome. Everybody's going to love it. And he, he, this is, I learned Mr. Arakawa's got like three things that he does. One of them is he goes, hmm. <laughs> 
And so I'd say again, what do you think? I mean, it'll be great. And then this is the second thing that he did, and you'd go, hmm. <laughs> he, he, he uh, Mr. Arakawa is a very smart guy, very engaging guy, um, not a big talker, um, spoke, spoke, understood and spoke English very well from the first day I met him, but he either was a little bit um, insecure about it, which I think is probably not the case, or he just used it as a tool to not talk <laughs> when he didn't want to talk. And, and also to understand more than maybe the person on the other side of the conversation thought he understood. Um, but nobody was interested in Nintendo in, in bringing this thing out right away. They were still into the arcade games. But eventually, I mean, well, what, what made them interested? Because there were some attempts even early on to get it out there, including that uh, deal with Atari that fell through, right? Yeah, so in, in 84, the arcade business had started to, it had really done this big um, bubble around Pac-Man and, and, uh, and Donkey Kong and a bunch of other games. But then, like 84-ish, um, it started, 84, 85, it was really starting to kind of slow down. And that combined with the history of the home video systems, which had had this big bubble, made everybody nervous that maybe the whole arcade industry was just going to go away. And because of that, they were looking for other things. And so that's when they put together the ABS, the Advanced Video System. Um, and that was in uh, late 84. Uh, and they showed this system. Um, and all of the industrial design for this, meaning that the housings on the outside, et cetera, were done by Lance Barr. I didn't, did I give you a picture of Lance? No. Anyway, Lance, I think, just recently retired. From oh, did he? Yeah, because yeah. he was there forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah like Don. Um, but they did this version of the uh, Nintendo system of the Famicom, and actually this is is very much like the Famicom, in the, except for the silly joystick on the left. But it had a tape drive, and it had a, a keyboard. The, Fami, the Famicom, you could also get a tape drive for it for storing, um, storing memory. And also you had a keyboard, and you could use that for doing some very crude basic um, programs. And then they had a keyboard hooked up to it, and it's a folding light gun where the, the handle folded down on it. Um, it's a very sort of sharper image. This is the way I like to think of it, like that store. Yeah, it was supposed to be, this, was, this is when all you had at home was a stereo and a radio and a television. And there weren't there weren't a lot of components out there. There were no video game systems, there were no laser discs or, or DVDs or Blu-rays or anything like that. So this was Nintendo's way of saying, here's something that you could put not in the back office to do computer programming, but you can put it out in your in your living room. So uh, buyer interest kind of lukewarm from what we know. Uh, there was an exhibit. Of to show this off at, at uh, Winter CES January 85. Um, I think you might be the only person who took home a brochure. This is literally a scan from your brochure. <laughs> um, I'm a pack rat, thankfully. Um, I kept a lot of stuff. Um, and in fact, this is actually in our archives now, thanks to, thanks to you, so, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, nobody, nobody was interested in it, none of the retailers, because the um, arcade industry was kind of going down because the um, the debacle of the Atari um, home systems. So nobody really wanted to touch this thing, although we were trying to kind of present it as we, um, Nintendo Japan, Mr. Arakawa, were trying to present it as something, you know, new, tacky, and cool. Nobody was really interested in, in it or taking a risk in it. So back to the drawing board, uh, literally in this case. Uh, so this Japan came back with this design, right? Like the ABS. No, no, this is this is uh, Lance's. Lance did the ABS design, right? And then Japan said no, <laughs> which pissed him off. And so we did the lunchbox design, which is what we ended up with. And this is what we then came back in the summer with. And the biggest addition there was Rob the robot, um, and it looked not like it, it looked more like a toy. And the fact that it had the zapper and Rob the robot um, was sufficient yeah. to kind of make it feel like, hey, this is a new, a cool new game that's not as simple as a, a, 
an Atari 2600 playing in ET. It's you know a cool new game, and boy, look at the graphics. It looks like the arcade games that you you can play, and it has the zapper um, with the V blank technology. You guys all know how that works. Okay, cool. So, um, and it had Rob Rob the robot. So, which was <laughs> very. I mean, you know, you op I open boxes, and when I open the Rob box, I go, well, this is kind of cool. Again, Art Howe didn't tell me anything about this, this and there's, you know, like 12 people in the company at the time, so nobody else, everybody else is doing their stuff, so I'm the only person who's opening the boxes, plugging it in, putting batteries in the bottom of Rob, and then, you know, I, I can see from the instructions and point them the, the, the diagrams of how to use it, that you point them at the screen. And then all he does is do this really noisy thing as he, as he moves his arms. It's just crazy slow, too. But, but he looks good. He does. He looks good. Um, I, I thought this photo would be an interesting one to show because um, this isn't actually a system. This is uh, a woodblock carving as a prototype. And, and you can kind of see some weird minor differences. Like the two controller ports are on top of each other. You can see really closely. And then the, uh, the cart designs are kind of strange with, with very boring labels. I don't know if you can see those, so uh, I'm glad they, they ended up uh, uh, changing that. But okay, so it's 85, video games are still dead, retailers still not totally convinced, right? So uh, you guys hit New, York, hit New York for a test launch. Yeah, so our account finally said, um, we're, we're going to test this um, to see if we can sell it. We're going to go to, New, we're going to test it in the New York market, so New York, New Jersey. And... Um, how many of you, well, anybody from New York, New Jersey? Were you, did, were you there in 85? Oh, uh, okay. Because you, you look maybe old enough, maybe. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we went to New Jersey. Don James and Rob Thompson and I um, took a flight out, landed in the hurricane, just after the hurricane, first airplane in. Uh, you know when the pilot says, it's going to get a little bit bumpy, you might want to take a little extra tug on that seatbelt before we land. We, I've never, I've done hundreds of flights in my, in my lifetime, never been on a flight like that, where we were the first one into landing in Newark um, after the hurricane had blown through, but the winds were still really strong, and so the guy is landing the airplane like, He's going to crash it because he wants to go fast enough so that the wind can't come behind and you know drop the airplane. Um, so we were the first ones in after the, the hurricane. There was a, two inches of water all over the airport. We got three rental cars. I'm a, by then I was, I don't know, 25, 26, and I've got a rental car that's mine for, for three months. And um, this on the upper left there, that's the very first shipment of Nintendo um, 8-bit Nintendos to the U.S. Um, and uh, we couldn't wait for them to get sent by boat to Seattle and then shipped across the country. If they come by boat, it would have taken nine days, and if then they ship them across the country, it would have probably taken another three, four days if they'd gone, gone straight. So we air freighted these ones in. And then you go to the other, on, yeah, that's the, that's the warehouse. In New Jersey. That was our Hackensack, New Jersey warehouse, where we both shipped out the games, or shipped out the games to the stores, and then also we did final assembly work on the uh, on the demo units, on the displays. Yeah, and that's what you actually are seeing here, the, uh, the point of purchase store displays back here. I yeah, recognize those. Those oh, little trapezoidal <laughs> plexiglass things. I just, I just heard from a display collector in the corner. That's the title display, right? That's the case? Yeah. 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 So imagine, this, it, this was really fun. This was three months of doing nothing but um, getting up in the morning, racing with Don and, and Rob. We would, we would do Dukes of Hazard over the train tracks in, in Hackensack every day. Because we'd all leave at the same time. And he always wanted to get the first parking spot. Um, only got one ticket while I was there, um, but but we um, get up early in the morning, go straight into work, um, 
take the get the shipments in, send them, um, make the shipments to go out to all the stores around New York, New Jersey, then start putting together the display units, and then throw those in the back of your rental car, and then drive to you name the shopping mall or the store in Manhattan, etc., and and then go and set them up inside the store, and then on Thursday, Friday, or excuse me, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, then we do mall demos, which is the uh, pictures on the bottom. We set up these little mini display units, and then go in and, and basically spend eight hours um, just demoing them, too. And we, yeah, have, we have an artifact of that, actually. So this, you know what this is. Um, this is your personal script for explaining what the rob was to people. <laughs> yeah, and well, and I wrote this later, but I gave so many demos to parents. Kids knew what to do, or at least they did. They thought they knew what to do. To do, right, Nestor? Um, they, you know, they just started playing. So we didn't really demo to them. We just let the kids play. But occasionally, parents would say, you know, what's this shit? And then, so I, I probably did, you know, hundreds going on thousands of rob demos during that three month period. And then when I finished and was gonna go back to Seattle, they needed, <clears throat> they needed to know what I was doing. And I was the only person who would do the rob demo, so I wrote this script, which <laughs> I- Your handwritten notes on the left. Yeah. Right there, yeah. um, so, obviously the, the, the test market goes well, you guys go national in 86, and you know, suddenly you're, you're a much bigger, Consumer-based company, you have you have you have an audience, right, of people who are now Nintendo uh, consumers uh, actively maybe purchasing new products. So uh, there's a lot you guys have to kind of do to change as a company, right? Like one thing would be establishing the Game Counselor Group, right? This is just a still from a YouTube video. But. Right, right. So um, I came back um, right after Christmas and. Uh, we st we started. Mr. Arkell wanted to get information from who was buying the games, um, so we started up the game counselor line so we could get people's information. We could, and we wanted to get it either through warranty cards, which required people to write stuff on a piece of paper and put a stamp on it and send it back, which nobody wanted to do, or we could get information because they would if they called in. So we had a free 800 number and. People could call in and say, I'm playing this game. I don't know how to you know, make it work. Uh, I don't know how to beat this boss, or I'm stuck here, etc." And so he started by um, hiring just six kids, two kids, you know, people who are maybe 18, 19 years old, to um, give tips over the phone. Not tell them the solution, but just to give tips. Well, very quickly that expanded. Everybody started calling, because it was free. So everybody was calling all the time. And, and we ended up with over 200 game counselors and on a daily shift we probably had like 125 at any one time just all in this big cube farm playing games and answering, answering questions. So not only did you have to establish that sort of um, customer service branch, you also sort of had to start taking game quality seriously, right? Especially as you um, got uh, third parties involved and weren't just making or just sell yeah, Nintendo it, was, games. it was always important, but I suppose it was always important to me, you yeah. know, whether the game sucked or it was fun, and I always told Arkell what I thought of, you know, this game sucks, this game's fun, etc. But then um, we started getting, um, when, we, when we first started in 85, the Famicom, remember, came out in 83, so there was games being made for it, and by uh, 85, there was, I think, like 45 games that had been made. And so I, Mr. Arkell said, so which, you know, which game should we ship with this? You know, and so I played them all and then I just wrote up a very simple little, here's the good games, because the other ones were lame and, and kind of strangely japanese cute, which um, pop culture is, has really embraced more cute than, than, um, than it did back at that time. I mean, cute back then meant Barbie. And, and now cute needs a whole range of things. But there, a lot of the games were just too cute. And um, by this time, by an 86, um, now we had a lot more games were being developed for Famicom in Japan by the Japanese developers like Chemco and, Ta and Taito and Tecmo and, and, and 
data east and, and on and on. And we were looking at those to, those companies wanted to um, ship them for the US. The first couple of licensed titles were actually branded Nintendo games. Um, like Yard Fight and uh, no, the no. race game. Was there a racing game? Oh, uh, F1 game. Oh, well, Rat Racer? Is that what we're thinking? No, 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 no. Before that. What was the, It was one. <laughs> Look at your list. <laughs> I mean, F1 race didn't come out here. There was, there was a Famicom F1 race, but it didn't come out here. It was, it was, it was meant to come out here as a Nintendo 500, because I know weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. What was the name of the game? Really? <laughs> Howard brought paperwork to back this up. Uh, what we're looking at, by the way, is Howard's uh, evaluation of Urban Champion. <laughs> it's, uh, according to Howard, I don't know if you read the text, too simple, lacks depth. Um, score 18 out of 40. It really didn't like that one. Um, yeah, there was better fighting games, like the Kung Fu game by Arm was, was yep. a much better fighting game. And this yeah. game was just, just lame. So um, even back then, even back in time now, no one pretended to like Urban Jim. <laughs> so um, I evaluated all the games. Also, my Don James and Mr. Oda evaluated all the games, though Don dragged his feet a lot and wouldn't always evaluate them because he was just getting too important to do, to play games. And Mr. Oda did it diligently because he was told by Mr. Arkawa he needed to. Um, so this. This started the process where we evaluated every game. Eventually, this became part, um, rolled into the power meter in Nintendo Power Magazine, yeah. uh, was taking this information and putting it into uh, power meter by just collapsing the eight measures down to four. So I'm gonna start blasting through this stuff because we are running okay, uh, very low on time, unfortunately, and I do want to get to questions. Um, so. As you guys are sort of building out your, your more consumer-facing presence, you start sort of publishing, right? Like you edited the official Nintendo Player's Guide. Yes. And uh, <laughs> quick, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. The way you described it to me once was it nearly killed you. Um, but you know, you had to start uh, uh, talking to your audience a little more frequently. So that's uh, the Fun Club News was because of the 800 line. Yeah. We were getting way too many phone calls on the 809. So, so you we want figured to send we, tips we, ahead of time. You know, if we could send out something like this, then we could, like the Fun Club News, that that addressed like the top five things that we're, we were getting asked right. about, then we could maybe cut our phone calls in half, which would save boatloads on our monthly phone bill. <laughs> and then also, because we had to send this in the mail, mm -hmm. we could get the address Addresses? of the, <laughs> of the kids. Uh, here's you as the fun club editor. You're a little yeah, off model with a yeah, necktie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy with a bow tie. But yeah. to your point, you got about three million addresses that you sent this thing to for free. Yeah. So um, first yeah. hits free, kids. <laughs> the audience. So uh, Gail Tilden, who worked in marketing, was asked by Mr. Arcella to do the fun club news, and then because of who's familiar with the Famicom magazines in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Another true gamer. Um, so in Japan, because Famicom had by now like hundreds of games, they had this super thick magazine of like 200 pages of, with details on all the games that were coming out and all sorts of really small screenshots, etc. And all in Japanese. And I was, I would get these things in a box from Japan with something that said magazine on it. And I'd go through them with a fine tooth comb to see, you know, what was the cool new games that I might get soon. And uh, Arakawa said, we're going to do a big magazine. And Gail said, great. And so Gail uh, and I were co-editors on uh, the magazine. It was um, uh, pretty successful. Uh, yeah, it was fairly successful. It was only all of us read it. Um, <laughs> And you became a cartoon character in the process. Yeah, we were looking for ways to do, um, we wanted to um, both promote the very best games, and we also wanted to keep the phone calls uh, down as much as possible. And so we could just show you in a feature about a game how to do that, or we could do uh, 
uh, a couple tips. I think we had pro tips was one of the sections. Yeah. And we had a couple different ways of giving tips. But we were looking for new, new ways to do it. And Gail said, well, why don't we do a cartoon of Howard and you can tell people. Because I you know, was doing a lot of the, uh, had done a lot of the stuff in New York of just teasing the answers out of the kids. They said, well, we can do a cartoon with, with you. And, and really, the Howard Nestor um, cartoon was based on, on the hundreds of conversations that I would have with, with kids. It was just the quintessential kids. You know, I knew that. Don't, you know, don't even reach for the controller out of my hand. I'm going to keep playing. And so I just give them, you know, give them little tips and say, oh, that, that doesn't seem to be working, does it? You know, and then they you know, bear down more. <laughs> I say, hmm, I wonder where it could be hidden, you know, and then they come up with the answer. Um, so uh, when we went, I fly to Japan, to Tokyo with Gail every month, and we'd go through, um, the, the production of the magazine was done in Tokyo. And um, I'd fly there with Gail, and we would go through all of the um, workup for the current magazine that was about, we do the proof check on it, and then we'd also do the editorial on the next one, go through all the details. And, and this is the um, scans of two of the drawings that they had put together in advance of the Howard and Nestor. They said, well, here's Howard, so you know this is where I got to see what I look like. <laughs> and they said, here's Nestor, a typical kid. And then um, on the right is the artist put together, here's, here's what a panel would look like of Nestor responding. So this is the very first talking Nestor of, of him Jesus saying... first words. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that, I love that, you know, that you're not so smart thing. <laughs> so we literally have five minutes left. Um, uh -oh. So I'm just going to blast through this. Go, go, yeah. go. Go in, here's a uh, tour. And, uh, talk about us for a second because uh, I did fly all this way. <laughs> um, so I mentioned Video Game History Foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, among other things, uh, we try to document and preserve things that would be of interest to game historians like the memories of Howard Phillips, uh, like the paper that uh, we talked about earlier. Uh, we are opening a uh, library pretty soon. It used to be in my living room as seen here, but um, we have an office now, and literally the day before I flew out, this uh, horrible, horrible pallet came in that I had to push down the street with this FedEx guy. But uh, <laughs> here's our library shelves in our actual library. That's basically what the library looks like right now. It's not very attractive. Um, but the point is that we're trying to encourage people to research video game history by uh, actually touching the artifacts. And I don't mean the games. I mean things like the paperwork and the like the evaluation forms that Howard had shown. Um, and, and to sort of make history come more alive than, than, than it can by just, by just playing a game. And, and Howard, uh, I was so thrilled to learn, is, is, uh, has volunteered basically to uh, help advocate with us uh, about the importance of saving things like this. Uh, not only through talking to you guys through events like this, but uh, to sort of introducing me to people that, that he's met. To having, we had a really great dinner last night because and you're you are a brilliant guy who gave me a lot of interesting ideas to think about. Um, but then also, there's a little bit of a, of a like uh, donating uh, some of your materials component to it as well, which has been extremely helpful. Okay, so here's the scoop. We're, we're all game enthusiasts, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm getting old. And, I mean, I'm 61. And my peers from that time who worked on the games and who uh, developed them, were either as programmers, an artist, or producers, um, etc. They're all getting old too, and I looked at I I pretty much finished making games now. I've done 165 or something in my in my career, and what I want to do is make sure that all of the cool and fun and interesting stuff that that was done back then is somehow captured both for your guys' generation and for future generations. And that's something as simple as me going through my basement and pulling out all sorts of stuff that, you know, like my mom. <laughs> your mom kept that brochure. Yeah, she did. You know, my mom would send me clippings of stuff, et cetera. 
Um, but it's also, um, more importantly, it's, it's things like the source code for games, et cetera. Because if we can find those source codes, then we can get the, the core art. So not just the games, but the source code for the art, for the games under development, also games that didn't get released, et cetera. So Frank is, is, um, is hardcore into games and hardcore into collecting, but not just collecting the individual games themselves and saying, look, I got a complete set, you know, sealed in box. But he's interested in collecting all the source material from the developers wherever we can and saving that information for the future. So it's a really cool thing. It's what I want to um, focus my energy on um, for, the, for the next five years or so as it relates to games. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. <laughs> So, I'm willing to kind of hang out in the back for a minute if you are. Out in the hallway. Out in the hallway? Okay. We just, we just been kicked out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to go hang out in the hallway with a group of people if you guys just want to ask questions and I'll try and answer them. I'm sorry I was so worried earlier. No, no. Oh. Were you guys bored? No. no. Okay. So let's go continue outside.